Breaker one nine. Hey, I woo! I hear me now. Um, kids sermon notes. I told you they were here. I actually have one. Does anybody need one? Jay, do you need one of these? I'm kidding. Kidding. Well, if you got your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up. We're going to be in the book of Acts. No, I'm kidding. We're going to be in Isaiah. Um, we've been in Acts. <laughs> I heard some of us say, whew. Um, yeah, no, we've been in Acts long enough that uh, it, it's probably just a force of habit to open to Acts now. But we're going to jump away for just a little bit as we prepare for Christmas. Um, some of you may know that this is Advent, like it's the Advent season. Some of you may not know what Advent is. I grew up in a church where we didn't talk about Advent at all. So whenever I started going to a church that did talk about it, I was a little, you know, I was a little shocked. So Advent is this time of preparation, um, is essentially what it is. It's this time of preparation as we start looking forward to the Christmas season, as we start looking forward to Christmas, where we ultimately celebrate the birth of, of Jesus. So that's what we're going to be doing. If you have a Bible, open it to Isaiah. We're going to be in chapter 9. That's where we will be as we start looking at Advent. And this week's theme is hope, is hope. And it's just great. Hope comes up all over the place. Lisa started talking about, about this acronym with hope. And I'm like, man, this is, it's amazing how God just kind of orchestrates things and puts something on your mind and then just keeps on driving it home. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And if, if we get to the end of this time in God's Word, and you're like, hey, what did we talk about? Then I have failed you miserably because hope is all over the place, and it's one of the easiest things as a Christian to talk about. Like, hope should just ooze out of us because we have hope. We have hope. So let's stand together and read God's Word. Isaiah chapter 9. Beginning of verse 1 says this, Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to the Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at time of or at harvest time, and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of the oppressor, just as you did in the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garment of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Thank God for his word. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I I thank you for bringing us such an awesome hope, like a hope for a future, a hope of of, of prosperity, God, a hope of of joy, a hope of peace, God. And you, Lord, you've brought all of these to us. So God, as as we study these words from some thousand years ago from your prophet Isaiah, God, I pray that you would let it speak to us today um, and bring us hope. And just remind us that we have a God who's not distant, a God who hasn't forgotten us, but, but one who is near to us and remembers us and has given us an awesome promise of hope. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in this time and let us know you more as a result of it. And then as we go to live differently. God, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, hope. Hope. What do you think of when you think of hope? That's kind of a rhetorical question. Um, What do you think of whenever you think of hope? Because I hear hope, and I'll tell you what I think of, and I think most of us probably think of whenever we think of hope. We think of something wishful. Like, I say I hope for something. I'm probably saying I'm wishing something to be true. 
or I'm, I have this desire or this longing for something to be true. And I don't think that's necessarily wrong. As a matter of fact, that's, that's right, given a dictionary definition of hope. It's something that's longed for. I mean, I could say, I hope I win the lottery, and that would not be inaccurate. Like, I, I, am, <laughs> I would love to win the lottery. That's something that's wishful. Now, there's a lot of problems in that because, one, I don't play the lottery for a number of reasons we can get into later. But if you don't play, you're probably not going to win it. And two, it's highly unlikely, right? We know that the probability of winning the lottery is incredibly slim. Incredibly slim. So while it isn't wrong, it's not complete. At least not in terms of what we're talking about today. Something that you long for or something that you wish for, that is something that hope is, but it's incomplete, at least in the sense that the Bible uses hope. Like whenever we talk about hope in the Bible, it's, it's bigger than that. It's a bigger idea than just some wishful thought that you have. Hope, whenever we dive into God's word, it actually comes with this sort of confidence. There's a, a sense of, of expectation or anticipation. And that's what the Bible talks about whenever it talks about hope. It's, it's, it's this idea, okay? Now, I mentioned winning the lottery. That's one kind of hope. That's like that wishful thinking. Then there's another kind of hope, whereas if we were to leave right now, drive down I-29, you get to the Nottoway River Bridge, you're going to hope that it holds you up as you go across, right? There's an expectation that it will. And that's a place that I'm going to put my hope in. I'm probably not going to put my hope in the lottery, not like that expectation, I'm not going to have that hope there. But as I drive across the bridge, I'm going to expect and anticipate that it's going to hold me up. Now, I know that's not always the case, and we actually have a firmer hope where we're at in God's word, but that's the kind of hope. That's the idea that we have here. There's this expectation. It's, it's an anticipation, a longing for with, with confidence. That's what the Bible's talking about whenever it talks about hope. It's not this sky or pie in the sky kind of hope that we, we a lot of times think of whenever we think of hope. It's something bigger than that. It's deeper than that. In this text that we just read, a few minutes ago comes right on the heels. I just got to set the stage for you a little bit because this comes right on the heels of these people hearing that they are going to be invaded and they are going to be overthrown. And then they're going to be taken into exile. Like these people just heard this terrible prophecy knowing that they are going to be defeated. And that's where this comes in. And I just, I just can't help but think about what these people were thinking. Like what, what was what was running through their minds as they're told, hey, you are going to have your nation conquered. I mean, as a matter of fact, you go back, if your Bible's anything like mine, the heading on Isaiah chapter 8 actually says the coming Assyrian invasion. And that's what it's about. It's talking about this invasion that's coming their way. And now we're going to talk about hope as a result of that. Like, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it gets more hopeful. It does get more hopeful. Because you get to verse 1 of chapter 9, and the first words there say, Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times. Like, these people have just been told that an invasion's coming, but your gloom's not going to be like that of the former times. How is that the case? If you know the, if you know the background around this, you know that the northern tribes have already been defeated. The northern tribes of Israel have already been defeated, and now the southern tribe is getting this warning that they are going to be defeated. And it's like, hey, your gloom's not going to be like that of the northern tribes, though. Why? Like, they're still going to be defeated. As a matter of fact, if you just look from a human perspective at the his historical facts around it, you might say that the, that the evasion and the exile of the southern tribes was, was worse like, the temple's destroyed, they're taken from their homes as slaves, a lot of them are put to the sword. Like, it's a pretty nasty deal. So how is it that their gloom is not like that of the distress of, of these other tribes? Why is that? And at first, it's kind of a hard, hard thing to think about, like, actually figure out, like, why is their gloom not, not the same? Why is it that their distress isn't the same? Why is it? And there's actually a pretty simple answer when you start thinking about it. It's because their exile, their invasion, comes with a promise. There's a promise attached. He goes on to give them all sorts of reasons to hope. He just pours it on them like, look, your gloom's not going to be the same, and here's why. And then he starts spelling out these promises. 
And look, most of, us know, most of us know this passage, or at least parts of this passage, right? We read, for unto us a child is born. Like, if you guys have been raised in the church, or you've been around the church any amount of time, or you even go through Hobby Lobby and start looking at Christmas decorations, you're going to see, for unto us a child is born, all over the place. And we're celebrating Christmas time, right? That's everywhere. So you've heard this passage, but I just want us to understand the weight of what's going on, like the emotion behind this. These people are literally just told that this, this foreign kingdom that is known for its brutality is going to come in and going to overthrow you. Like, here's what this means. Older guys, that means that you're probably going to be killed. They're just going to kill you because they don't have a use for you. Younger guys, you're going to be put to forced labor. I'm not even going to get to what it means for women. I mean, it's, it's brutal. Like, this is dark stuff, and this is what they're hearing. But then they're given a promise. And the hope that this child brings... Man, while this is still something that we ought to celebrate today, these people are hearing this for the first time. Like, the gloom isn't going to be the same because there's this child that's coming. And that brought hope. That's why their gloom wasn't the same. And in the same way, you and I, we have a promise of a Savior who is going to return someday. And that ought to bring us a whole lot of hope. Like a whole lot of hope. So as we look at these next... Next six verses, I want to show you six things that we all hope for, all of us hope for. Every single one of us, whether we admit it or not, we all hope for these six things, and I want to show you that these things are only found in Jesus. Now, I know that's a lot of things, so we'll move pretty quick, I promise. So, six things we all hope for. Number one, we all hope for a light. We hope for a light. Okay, verse two says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. Okay, and this, this is a prophecy that is clearly fulfilled by Jesus. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew says that this is fulfilled by Jesus. He blatantly says that this is why Jesus went the way he did. This is what's going on. It was to fulfill this prophecy. If you're not sure where, it's Matthew chapter 4, verse 13 through 16. He clearly says that Jesus went where he did to fulfill this prophecy. So this prophecy has at least in part been fulfilled already. But our hope, you and I, we still have a hope for light. We still have a hope for light. There is an awful awful lot of darkness around us. Now, I know the sun's kind of out today. I know it's a little overcast, but that's not what I'm talking about. When the Bible's talking about darkness, it's talking about wickedness, judgment, and death. Almost every time, whenever you see darkness, it's wickedness, judgment, and death. And he's saying that there's going to be a light that comes to shine into this darkness. And if we look around us right now at our world, there is wickedness, there is judgment, and there is death. It's still there. Like, you can look around and you know these things. This isn't something I have to convince you of. I actually thought about this whenever I was, as I was preparing, I thought about giving all these statistics on things that you'd be like, oh boy, there is a whole lot of wickedness around us, like giving statistics on drug use or statistics on abortion or whatever the case may be. But I don't think I need to convince you that wickedness is all around us. I really don't think I need to. Even more than that, judgment is all around us. Death is all around us. You know what the mortality rate is for human beings? 100%. 100% mortality rate. Everyone's going to die. And some of you are being the sarcastic people thinking, well, there's examples in the Bible of people who don't die. That's true. There's two. Okay, fair enough. The reality is there's death all around. And we still live in a land that's full of darkness. So I probably don't need to convince you of that all that much. And here, here what this text is doing, what Isaiah is doing is he's giving this prophecy. He's saying there's going to be a light that shines into this darkness. Like this land of wickedness, this land of judgment, this land of death. And these people got it because they knew what was coming. They just heard of this invasion. So this is, this is weighing on them. And they get this promise of a light. And he comes and says it's going to come through a child. Like through this child? That's going to be a hard thing to hear when you're talking about, hey, we're getting ready to be politically and, and literally physically oppressed. And you're saying we got to wait for a child. But listen, Jesus is still the light that we need. 
That hasn't changed. Jesus is still the answer to wickedness, still the answer to judgment, and still the answer to death. Like, he is the solution. He is the light we need. He is still where our hope needs to be if we want to have any chance with these things. If you don't want to face judgment, the judgment that ultimately we all deserve, Jesus is the solution. You may die a physical death, but there's another death that the Bible talks about, which is an eternal death, and Jesus is the solution to that problem. He is the light that we need. And just to be clear, a lot of religions, they teach this idea of of dualism. Some of you may know what dualism is, some of you may not. Whatever, there's this idea a lot of religions teach of, of a dualism where you have light and darkness and these things are constantly battling. Like these things come, you know, face to face and they just go back and forth. That is absolutely not what the Bible talks about. Like the Bible is abundantly clear that there is no yin and yang. It's like one just completely overwhelms the other. Like the light is so much greater than the darkness. It cannot stand in its presence. Like it, it's, it's abundantly clear. Like the, the light overcomes the darkness. John chapter one, verse five says, the light, which is referring to Jesus, the light shines in the darkness and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Like it's this picture of if we turn the lights out in here, if we did that right now, it'd be dark. You know what happens the minute you flip that light on? It's not dark anymore. You get this. This is easy. Like, light cannot be overcome by darkness. Darkness is just the absence of the light, right? And that's what, the, that's what he's telling him here. He says there's a light that's coming, and it's, there's no way the darkness can stand against it. The wickedness, the judgment, the death that you are going to face, that you all know is coming, the light cannot stand against it because Jesus came and he took the judgment that you deserve. He died of the death that you deserve. And our hope and our expectation is that Jesus was and still is the light that we all need, the light that we all hope for. We all hope for a light. We all hope for a light. Second, we all hope for joy. We all hope for a joy. I mean, if I came around the room right now and said, hey, do you guys want joy in your life? Nobody's going to say, no, I just want to be miserable my whole life. I don't want joy. Get that away from me. Everybody wants joy. Everybody does. And then we see in verse 3, he says, You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they have rejoiced at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. Okay, now, the original language in the Hebrew, this is, this is kind of a mess. Like the language used here is kind of a mess. It's kind of hard to translate. So some of your translations may say something a little bit different, but what we know for a fact is that he's talking about rejoicing. He's talking about this this idea of being joyful. And we all want to be joyful. And these people who were just told they were going into exile are also being told, you're going to rejoice. Like you're going to have joy. That is coming so that you're going to multiply. And then the next picture he uses probably makes sense to all of our farmers. Like he talks about, talks about the harvest. <laughs> Some of you guys get that. Like you go out and you harvest, you got this great crop, and you're thinking, oh man, my year is made. This is awesome. I've got a bumper crop. I'm going to be made. Not just this year. I've probably got next year made. I'm going to go buy a new tractor, a new combine. I'm spending all sorts of money because we had an awesome crop. And some of you are thinking, man, I didn't have an awesome crop this year. I'm, I'm sorry for bringing that up. But that's the picture, though. That's the picture. And they're saying, how are we going to have joy when we're living in a foreign nation as slaves, in a place where we don't know the people around us, we don't speak the language, how are we going to rejoice here? How are we going to have joy here? And the only way that they can have joy is if they have hope for a future. Right? So he brings this promise, he brings this promise for a hope of joy in the future that's going to come. Because they can't find their joy in their circumstances. They can't find it in their circumstances. Their circumstances are terrible. Can't find joy in that. But see, that's no different from us. We're not intended to find our joy in our circumstances. That's not what we're made for. I mean, if you're trying to find joy just in your circumstances, you might be temporarily happy, but ultimately you're not going to be joyful for very long. They are all going to run out every single time. Your circumstances aren't where your joy should be found. And if they are, you're not going to be very joyful for very long. 
I mean, just money. There's never enough of it. Ever enough of it. You may be happy whenever you have that bumper crop, but eventually that money's going to run out. Then what? And what he's saying is the joy that you have is not in your circumstances, but it's in the hope that you have. That's where your joy is found. And we all want that joy, and it needs to be in our hope for a future. If you don't believe me, this is all over the Bible, like this idea of not being hopeful or being joyful because of your circumstances. It's all over the Bible. I actually think Paul hits it on the head over and over and over again as he writes his letters. As a matter of fact, the book of Philippians, the entire letter of Philippians, it's about joy. It's about being happy. And you know where Paul writes that from? He's a prisoner whenever he writes it. Yeah, and he's saying, rejoice. (laughs) It's not because of his circumstances. It's not like Paul saying, hey, this is awesome. I get to sit in a prison cell. No, that's not what he's talking about. Instead, he's saying there's joy, not because of our circumstances, but because of our hope. That's where we find our joy. It is in the hope that Jesus brings. As a matter of fact, Paul says that that's the secret to joy. That's the secret to joy. He says in Philippians 4, 12 through 13, he says, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. You want to know how to be content? You want to know how to be joyful no matter what the circumstances are? You want to know how to do that? It's through him who strengthens me. It is through Jesus and nowhere else. If you want joy in your life, the only way to do that is to have the hope that comes in Jesus. Anything else will ultimately be insufficient. So we hope for a joy that is only found in Jesus. We hope for a light. We hope for freedom. Third, we hope for freedom. Again, I don't think there's anybody here who wants to be oppressed. Nobody wants to be oppressed. We all hope for freedom. In the verse 4, he says, You have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. So he tells them they're going to be conquered. And then he says that their oppressors are ultimately going to be defeated. To give them hope, he says, Ultimately, your oppressors will be conquered also. Those who oppress you will ultimately be defeated too. And it's not like they're just going to be partially defeated. No, no, he talks, the language he uses is is strong language. Like they're going to shatter the rod. Like it's going to be crushed. It's going to be eliminated. This oppression is going to be completely and totally thrown off. And to illustrate it, he talks about Midian. And some of you may not know where Midian comes from. It's actually from clear back in the book of Judges with the story of Gideon. Now, Gideon is one of my favorite stories. I kind of get excited about him because he's, this is where 300 actually comes from. We're not talking about 300, the movie. This is the good 300, not that other stuff. Um, because Gideon, at his time, the Israelites are living in caves, just kind of hiding as their oppressors are coming through. And Gideon's called a mighty warrior while he's hiding in a hole. Um, like, yeah, that sounds like a mighty warrior, doesn't it? And it's not because of him, it's because of what God's going to do. And ultimately, God uses Gideon to overtake the Midianites by using Gideon and 300 men. Completely and totally overthrows the oppressors with 300 men. Okay, so that's what he does there, and he gives them freedom. But, you know, we're not slaves, we're not starving, we're not hiding in holes, right? Right? We are here openly worshiping, so how are we oppressed? Does this really relate to us? Is this word for us? Y'all don't want to interact today. I can't blame you. Of course this word's for us. We are still oppressed. As a matter of fact, Paul uses the language of being slaves to sin. You go to Romans, he talks about being, we were once slaves to our own selfish desires. Talks about how we were slaves. And he uses that language of talking about how we had no freedom in it, that we were, we were trapped. And actually, whenever you go to Judges, it's not just a whole bunch of cool stories about how God delivered his people. It's bigger than that. It's actually a picture of what we all go through as we are all held, held captive. We are all oppressed. We are all held down and we are made weak by this thing called sin. That's what this is showing us. 
Like we are these people being held down by our own sin and we are oppressed by it and it keeps us down, hiding in fear. But Jesus comes and he says, I'm going to bring freedom. Because after that, I mean, the language changes. You, you, look, you, look at, you look at Paul, not Paul. Yeah, you look at Paul, whenever he writes Romans. You look at him whenever he writes Romans. At first he says you were once slaves to sin, but now he says you're a slave to God. Well, it sounds like you're giving up one kind of oppression for another kind of oppression, right? No, it's a little bit different than that. It's not quite the same thing. You were slaves of sin, but whenever you become a slave to God, which is the image that Paul's using, instead of getting this oppressive kind of slavery, instead it's God comes in and he sets you free from everything that held you captive before. He's this ruler that instead of coming in and holding you down, he sets you free. As a matter of fact, Galatians 4, 7, it says that we're no longer slaves, but sons. We are no longer slaves, but sons. And if we're sons, then we're heirs. It's giving us this picture where he's taken us from this captivity, from this oppression, from this bondage that we were in, and set us free from it, and gave us something far greater than just freedom. He actually made us heirs of his. It is an awesome picture. So we hope for a light. We hope for a joy. We hope for freedom. We hope for victory. We hope for victory. I mean, living in Mount City, I probably ought to say something. I mean, y- y'all, we all won a state title yesterday. I mean, does it feel good? Like victory? I don't know what that feels like. I grew up, I went South Holt, so I don't know anything. Um, yeah, I'll take a shot at South Holt. I'm, I'm alumni, I can do that. Um, So we hope for victory. Everybody wants to win, right? Everybody wants to win. Now, see, actually what I've come to find is that not everybody wants to win like I want to win. Um, It turns out that there are those people out there who don't have that competitive drive that, like, butt heads with people over things just because you have to win. I'm the kind of guy, I grew up with three brothers, and we did not lose to each other. Well, obviously somebody had to lose, but you sure didn't want to lose. Like, you would, do, you would cheat if you had to, but you're going to win. You know, there's that competitive drive. And we all want to win, but this is even bigger than winning because victory, while, yes, it has the idea of winning, it's, it's not just the winning, it's what comes after. Like, the, the good stuff that comes after. Like, you get to revel in that win. You get to enjoy that win. It's victory. And everybody wants victory. Like, everybody wants that. Whether you're the real competitive type or not, everybody wants to have victory in their lives. Again, nobody wants to live a defeated life. And that's what's being expressed here in verse 5 as it talks about the trampling boot of battle or the bloody garment of war. Uh, talking about the being burned as fuel for the fire. You're not going to go burn your, your battle garments when the battle's still going on, right? No, the picture here is what happened after the battle. What happened after the win they are going out and they're burning these things because the victory's been won and they're, they're being told that this victory of theirs is coming and they're gonna have this hope for victory and it's just, it's looming there in the future. They know it's coming and they can expect it and they can anticipate. Everybody wants victory. These are all signs of victory. These people are given a promise that that victory is coming. It may be hard now, it may be dark now, it may be a struggle now, it may be a strain. You may be oppressed, but victory is coming. And I know that's something I want. There are times in my life whenever I feel defeated, I feel deflated. There are times where I feel like there's this, there's this sin in my life, or there's this addiction in my life, or there's this struggle with my circumstances in my life, and it's like I just can't overcome this. Am I the only one that feels that way? Y'all ever felt that? That's hard. Like, that's a struggle. But we can hope. We can hope because God gives us a promise of victory. Not because we win the victory, because we're so strong and we go out and we battle these things. Instead, it's because we lean into Jesus and we trust him and he brings us that victory. He won the battle so that we could enjoy the victory. And he brings that to us. As a matter of fact, Paul in Romans 8, 37, he says that we've been made more than conquerors through Jesus. Like, that's not a picture of a partial or incomplete win. That's like total and complete victory. More than conquerors. Like, not only did you win, like, it's bigger than winning. 
It's so much better than that. And that's the picture that he gives here. Like we hope for a victory and that is only found in Jesus. So we hope for light, joy, freedom, victory. Number five, we hope for an ultimate king. For an ultimate king. Verse six says, for a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Like, the last several weeks we've talked about the power of a name, and now he's, they give this list of names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. That sounds like a pretty good name to be following. Like, that sounds like good stuff there. And I know I just said that we all hope for freedom, but now we're saying we hope for a king. Well, kings are over you, and they actually restrict your freedom, right? No, that's why I said the ultimate king, not, not some temporal king, not some mediocre king. No, no, this is the ultimate king who they are being promised will come. This king doesn't oppress, but instead he brings peace and joy and freedom. As a matter of fact, I put in my notes that he's, he is the king of freedom. Everything he does is freeing. And see, usually whenever we think of freedom, we think of, we think of being able to do whatever we want. And usually whenever we say, well, freedom means that I can do what I want, we think, well, that means that I can do whatever thing I know I shouldn't do that I really want to do. That's what we think of whenever we think of, like, I can do whatever I want. Like, I remember when, when I was a kid and I would talk to my parents and, like, they, they wouldn't be around. And I'd say, well, I can kind of do what I want because my parents aren't around, which really meant I can do what they told me not to do because they're not here to see it. That's what we think of whenever we think of this kind of freedom to do what we want. But it's, it's so much better than that. Instead, the freedom that he brings is a freedom that's not going to further enslave you like our own selfishness or our pride or our sin will. Instead, the freedom that he brings also brings that new heart that I, I love to talk about from Ezekiel 36 where he says he's going to give you a new heart. He's going to take your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh, put a new spirit within you. He brings that so our desires become more like his desires and he gives us the freedom to live the life that we were intended to live. He gives you all of that and we know, we know looking back on this that the ultimate king that he's pointing to, this child that was to be born, is Jesus. We know that that's who this son is that we're celebrating now. Like I don't see how you could read this and think, well, maybe that's not Jesus. Oh, there's no way. This is a blatant and obvious reference to Jesus. We've got this little nativity over here. That's the child. Like, Jesus is this child that they were pointing to. He is the ultimate king that they were all longing for. And wouldn't you love to have a ruler come who cares for you so much that not only was he willing to humble himself to come to you, but then he was willing to live a perfect life. And even though he didn't deserve it, he was going to die for you even though you deserve to die. Instead, Jesus is going to come in and say, I'm going to die the death that you deserve. I'm going to lay my life down for you. And this ultimate king, this ultimate king that they're, they're promised here, this child would come and he would lay down his life for them. He didn't just try to defend your freedom, but he came to reclaim it. And the first time he came, he came in a manger. So this is at least partially fulfilled, this prophecy is, because the first time he came, he came as a major, as a, in the manger as a humble servant. But there's going to be a day when he comes, and again, if you've been raised in the church, you know that Jesus says he's going to come again. He's going to come back. And the time, second time he comes, he's not coming as a humble servant. He's coming as the ultimate king the perfect king. He's going to come as a mighty king. He is going to come triumphantly. He will be the wonderful counselor that he already is. Mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. Titus 2.13 actually calls the second coming our blessed hope. You want something that should bring you hope, think about the second coming. Think that Jesus is going to come and everything that is wrong is going to be made right. the hurt, the pain, the struggle, it will all be made right when the ultimate king returns, when this triumphant king returns. And whether we realize it or not, we are all ultimately longing for this. We all want that, that perfect ruler. 
who gives us freedom, who pours himself out for us, who would do absolutely anything to us or anything for us. We all long for that. We all hope for an ultimate king. We hope for a light, joy, freedom, victory. Number six, we hope for eternal peace. We hope for eternal peace. Verse seven says, the dominion will be vast and his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. I'm actually not in love with my translation. I've actually been asked by several of you what, what translation I use. Just so you all know, I use the Christian Standard Bible. It's the CSB, if any of you are curious. I actually don't love my translation of this verse. I don't think it does a very good job. Most of your translations probably say something very different. Most of them probably say something at the beginning of government and peace that will go on forever. Um, so that's probably a better translation of this. It, it's the word shalom here at the beginning, which the Hebrew word shalom, which is literally peace. It's peace. Nobody wants to live in anxiety or in struggle or in this constant state of worry. We want peace in our lives. Everybody does. And you certainly want eternal peace. You don't want to live in a perpetual state of anxiety or stress or discomfort. You want to live in peace. Everybody wants to have peace forever. Everybody does. And that's what's being promised here. Isaiah tells the Israelites that one day they will have an ultimate king and his kingdom is going to go on and on and on forever. He will establish it in justice and righteousness. And he literally says that it's going to grow continually. There's not going to be an end to it. If you try to find the end, it's going to go further. There will be no end to this kingdom. It is going to be far greater than what you or I are able to manage and it will be full of peace. Filled with peace. And it says that this, this child is going to bring this. And these are people who would have desperately needed peace. Can you imagine the amount of anxiety or stress that you would be faced with if you were just told that somebody's going to take you from your home and put you to forced labor for the rest of your life? That is if they don't just kill you to begin with. Can you imagine the stress and the worry and the anxiety that's going to come with that? not something that you just forget about overnight. These people desperately needed peace, and they're given hope for this. But really, I mean, again, we need peace. Our society, our culture is one that is, that is marked, marked by being too busy or being too anxious or being too connected or something like that. We all need peace. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, there's actually this thing where people, people don't go on vacations because they get so stressed about going away from being connected all the time that they can't relax. It, they just can't do it. As a matter of fact, it's more stressful for them to think about relaxing and being unplugged than it is just being plugged in. It, it's so stressful. It is so anxious. And I know, uh, I know that that's hard. But I actually think about taking my kids on vacation. We go, we go to Minnesota every year. Um, and I think about taking my kids on vacation. And honestly, thinking about taking them on vacation is more stressful than just staying home with them because, you know, you got three kids you got to wrangle up, right? And you got to make sure that they're not trying to jump into a lake and they can't swim. So there's, there's all sorts of stress that comes with that. But you think about this, we all have these worries. We all have this anxiety. We all have these struggles in our lives. And I know that it's really easy to be critical of how plugged in some people are. Like people, Some people can't put their phones down. I'm probably guilty of that more often than I should be. Think about how connected we are. It's really easy to be critical of those people, but it's a, it's a real struggle. That's what our, our culture, that's what our society says that we are supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to be like. And actually saying that we need to just sit down, step back, and just be at peace. That's hard. That's hard to do. But ultimately, we have the one that they called the Prince of Peace. It was one of the names he was given. We have him on our side in this child that was born. And we can have a hope of peace because we know the one who brings peace. 
And this isn't going to be some temporary thing. It goes on and on and on forever. We will not have the anxieties. We will not have the fears. We will not have the worries or the stress. It will be there all the time. We will have peace. And all of us want peace. All of us do. So we all want, we all hope for light, joy, freedom, victory, and ultimate king for eternal peace. So what do we do? Like, what do we do with that? Well, again, this week's all about hope. All about hope. This longing for something that's to come. This anticipation or this expectation of something that's, that's to come. At least that was my intention, so I may have missed the mark, and I apologize if I did. But Isaiah's audience desperately needed hope, and you and I do too. And Isaiah's point is very clear. Your hope that comes in the future is found in this child. We're going to celebrate Christmas. We're going to celebrate Christmas here, which is all about a child that was born. We know that Jesus came, and we place our hope in that child who grew up to be a man who actually took your burden and mine and died for it. He's at the center of all of our hope. In fact, I would go so far as to say that he is hope. Like it is found squarely in him. So, so how do we get to this hope? How do we obtain this hope that's, that's brought out here? How do we actually like, receive that hope? Well, it's pretty easy. As actually, Jesus, Jesus makes it abundantly clear in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, he says, Come to me, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You want this peace, you want this king, you want all of these things that we just talked about, this light, joy, freedom, victory. If you want those things, it's incredibly simple to receive that. That does not mean that it's an easy life to live, but it means it's a simple, simple to receive. He just says, come to me. She says, come to me. See, the whole point of the Christian faith is not about doing something to receive anything. It's not about being someone to receive something. It's not about thinking a certain way or finding something in this life. It's not about any of that. Instead, it's about coming to Jesus and resting in him. That's what the Christian faith is. And not just to receive that, not just to receive his grace and just, just get these things once, but forever. Just continually leaning in him and resting in him. So here in a minute, we're going to offer an invitation. I'd like to invite you to come. And if you've never, if you've never known this, this peace or this hope or this joy, if you've, never, if you've never had that kind of hope for those things, I would like to invite you because it is incredibly simple. I'd love to talk with you and pray with you. As a matter of fact, I was just listening to one of my favorite preachers talking about, talking about what this is, what this faith thing is, and how it's really just believing God's revelation to us. Just believing it and placing our trust in his revelation, which is Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God because he is God. You can receive that. You can rest in him. You can have the hope that comes through him. But if you do know Jesus, if you're that person, uh, please, there's still application for you here. There's still something that you do as a response. Like this season, we're reminded of the hope that we have. Or at least we should be reminded of the hope we have. We're celebrating Christmas. We're singing carols all over the place. You drive down, there's lights all over the place. And I hope every time that you see one of those, see, I just said hope, and I didn't mean to. Every time you see one of those things, I want you to think, like, I have hope because of Jesus. This, this season that we celebrate, this Jesus that we celebrate, we have hope because of him. Hope of a Savior who loves us, cares for us, gave himself for us. He came humbly as a child, and one day he's going to come again as our triumphant king. That's a hope we're sharing. That's a hope worth telling people about. So tell people of the hope that you have in Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I, I thank you for bringing us hope, for giving us hope for a future, for giving us hope for joy, for, for peace, for freedom. God, I thank you for being the ultimate king that we all long for. God, and I pray that this, this Advent season, as we prepare ourselves, as we start focusing in on the birth of our Savior, God, I pray that you wouldn't let us be silent about the hope that we have. 
Now, I pray that you would embolden us, that you would strengthen us, that, that you would let us look forward, see the Savior that we have, and just, just long to tell people about it. So, Lord, I, I also want to pray today that, that those people who don't have any hope, those people who live in this, this land of darkness, this, even a mindset of darkness, that we can clearly see all around us. God, I pray that you would be the light that they so desperately need, that you would bring that to them, that you would, you would reveal yourself to them and give them that, that hope that we enjoy as Christians. Father, if there's anybody who, who hears this message today and they, they think, boy, I need that hope, like, I don't have hope. Father, I pray, I pray that you would let your church be the hope. Take that hope to them that you would let us be your hands and feet and just go and tell people that Jesus is the answer, that he's the solution to the darkness around us, to the wickedness, to the judgment, to the death, Lord. And I pray that we would know you and we would share you, that we would be the light that you've given us, that it would just shine through us and that more and more people would come to know you as a result of that. Father, what an awesome time of year as we celebrate your coming as we celebrate the fact that you humbled yourself and gave yourself for us. Father, I pray that we would remember that every single day and that we might use that as an opportunity to tell more people about you and that we could see people saved forever. That people would just have this eternal peace that we talked about. So Father, I pray that you would move. I pray that you would change hearts and lives and that your work would be done through your church. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name.